So what we're going to do today is to have a look at mass and energy, things that you know loads and loads about all the time. Okay. Um, energy, you probably know about something called conservation of energy. Okay. Energy is conserved, energy can't be created or destroyed. You with me, the amount of energy before something happens has got to be the amount of energy afterwards, etc. etc. And same thing with mass, really, although you probably don't even need to mention it, particularly in chemistry. You with me, the amount of mass you've got before reaction. You can change the chemicals around, you can make new compounds, but you've got to have the same amount of mass at the end. Okay? So in most areas of physics, we rely on the fact that energy is something which is conserved. All right? When you drop something, you know the potential energy at the start has got to equal the kinetic energy when it gets to the bottom and so on. Okay? Same thing with conservation of mass. All right? uh, in the world of the nucleus, and we looked at this last time, the world of the nucleus is a strange place. Okay? People at the start of the 20th century were starting to get their heads around the idea that atoms were incredibly tiny things and really mind-blowingly small, but actually inside the atom, as Rutherford and his team showed, there is a nucleus, okay? And the nucleus is a very, very strange place, okay? And one of the things which is rather strange about the nucleus is it's one of those places where this dividing line between mass and energy starts to get a bit blurred, okay? If you apply the laws of conservation of energy to the nucleus, you don't get quite the right answers. And if you apply, and this is the really strange bit, if you apply the law of conservation of mass, so number of kilograms before something happens, number of kilograms afterwards, you don't quite get the right answer. Okay? And the solution to this mystery is, in fact, what's happening is mass and energy are being converted from one into the other. Okay? And actually, physics is often about this, sort of zooming out, there's actually an even bigger picture which is that actually energy isn't conserved all the time and mass isn't conserved all the time. What is conserved all the time is something which Einstein called mass energy. All right. If you take a nuclear reaction, something happening inside the nucleus, and you say, is the total number of kilograms before equal to the total number of kilograms afterwards? The answer is no. Are the number of joules of energy equal before and after the reaction? The answer, amazingly, is no. But if you added up the two, yeah, if you said the total amount of mass and energy before and the total amount of mass and energy afterwards, then you would have something which is conserved. So in the nucleus, energy isn't conserved, amazingly. Mass isn't conserved, but something called mass energy, if you like, the total of mass and energy is conserved. Okay? It's a bit like if I dropped an object. Are you with me? If I drop an object, it's got GP up here, isn't it? And as it falls, the GP is turned into... Kinetic energy, you've done that sort of thing before. So potential energy is being turned into kinetic. If I said to you, I've got a law of physics which says potential energy is conserved, is the potential energy at the start of the drop the same as the potential energy afterwards? You'd obviously say, no, that's not true, is it? If I said there's a law of conservation of kinetic energy that says the kinetic energy at the start is the same as the kinetic energy at the end, is that true? Obviously not. It's got no kinetic energy at the instant you drop it, has it? And it's got loads when you get here. It's got tons of potential energy at the top and none when it reaches the ground. Okay? And if I said, do I give up then? I can't do physics. It's just ridiculous. GPE is not conserved. KE is not conserved. What's to do? You would say, well, actually, all you need to say is the total. In other words, the total energy. If you say, well, all you need to do, total of GP and kinetic, in other words, the total energy at the start and the total energy at the end, they are the same. All right. All that's happening is you're shuffling energy between the two, but the total remains the same. Does that sound familiar from lower down? That's really what we're saying in the nucleus. Although you've, you know, ever since you were t tiny, it relied on conservation of mass, conservation of energy. Yeah. Actually, there's something bigger. It's the total over those two which is being conserved. All right. Seems a you know, bonkers idea that mass could not be conserved or that energy could not be conserved. But it's a bit like them almost being like two forms of something bigger, all right? If you had somebody who couldn't get their head around that because GPE is not conserved and KE is not conserved, you'd say, well, no, actually, zoom out, take a bigger picture. It's the total energy. It's those two added together. That's staying the same, even though energy is shuffling between the individual bits, okay? Now, if you're thinking in the back of your mind, that's not going to work because you can't add kilograms to joules, yeah? If you're thinking, well, this is all very well, but... So many joules of GPE, so many joules of K, I can add them up to get the total energy, that's fair enough. But adding up mass and energy, 
it just seems ridiculous. So what we need is some kind of conversion. All right, we need some kind of conversion factor between mass, which we've traditionally measured in kilograms, and energy, which we've traditionally measured in joules. If this bonkers tale that I'm telling you this morning is going to work, how on earth do you work out the total mass energy? It normally has a hyphen in there. Although in my mind, I think of it like a plus sign. You with me? It's like adding the two together like we did with this one. Okay, but its proper name is mass hyphen energy. That's not going to work because you can't add kilograms to you. You just can't do that. Okay? So we need some form of converting between the two. And that's a good word to hang on to in your mind. All right? The bonkers stuff I'm going to show you this morning is really just a way of converting between kilograms and joules. So that you can say mass isn't conserved in this reaction, energy is not conserved in this reaction, but the sum of the two, the mass and the energy together, that is conserved, and what this reaction is doing is just squidging a bit of mass into energy, or turning a bit of energy into mass, which everybody else in the school will tell you is impossible, because their teachers have told them that many, many times, but you know, it's, um, it is actually possible in the wild and wacky world of the nucleus. Okay. Now, the good news is, I'm sure you've seen this equation, it's a very famous one. Uh, e equals mc squared. Everybody's heard of that equation. Um, it's not a very glamorous way of thinking about it. It's all to do with relativity and going backwards in time and stuff like that. But for you guys actually doing your A-levels, think of it as a conversion, all right? Think of it like when you go on holiday with your, your pound or your euro or something like that, and you want to convert it into dollars or some other currency. You look up and it says one pound is worth $1.4 or something like that or whatever. It's exactly the same thing, all right? So think of it like converting money. Yeah, oh, that's a very bad dollar sign. I'll definitely edit that, edit that bit out. That's a bit better. Okay, think of it like when you go on holiday, you turn your pounds into dollars or dollars into pounds. Imagine you've got 100 pounds, you go into the, um, the currency exchange place, you turn 50 of those pounds into dollars, yeah? And then you come out, so you've got 50 pounds worth of dollars, 50 pounds worth of pounds. Have you got the same number of pounds as before? No. Have you got the same number of dollars before? No. Have you got the same amount of money? To the extent, well, in theory, you have, haven't you? All right. So think of it a bit like money, and that's always the bit of your brain that works best with numbers. It's basically just a conversion. All right. When you go on holiday and you see on the thing it says one pound is one point four dollars, one point eight euros, or something. That's what this equation does. Okay. That's why I prefer to write it like this. Okay. There's the amount of energy. All right. Remember what this equation is going to do for us. It's going to convert energy into mass for us, and vice versa. There's the amount of mass. So here's the number of pounds. Here's the number of dollars. C squared is the exchange rate. All right. It's a bit of a bonkers idea, but that's a good phrase for your margin. C squared is the exchange rate. It tells you if you've got one kilogram. Yeah. If you've got one kilogram. So imagine you come from a country where the the, the currency is the kilogram. Okay. Um, it's quite heavy, I expect. Um, you, the currency is the kilogram, and you want to go to another country where the currency is the joule, yeah? And you turn up to the you know, currency place and say, right, I've got a kilogram. Can you turn this into joules? I'm going to another country where the currency is the joule. Uh, good news, because you will get, C, as you know, is the speed of light. You can cross that before. So C squared is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8, or the speed of light, all squared, which we can all do without a calculator, through the joy of standard form. 3 squared is 9, and when you square numbers in standard form, you double the power of 10, 10 to the 16. Okay, units? Would be C, but what have we done to C? It's meter squared per second squared, isn't it? It's the unit of speed, meters per second squared. So meter squared per second squared. Okay. Um, comments on size of number? Large. Yeah, it's a large number. All right. Um, so think of it like you come from a very successful country. You have the kilogram. I did have the kilogram somewhere. Hi. <laughs> so imagine. It's like this. You live in a country uh, with a very strong currency, the kilogram. Here's a kilogram, roughly. Um, 
and this is what you count as money, this is your kilogram, okay, and you're going to convert it into joules, you turn up, and good news, how many joules do you get for each kilogram? Can you see? You're going to get 9 times 10 to the 16 joules, not what that looks like, but can you imagine? So think of the kilogram like a really strong currency, yeah? I don't know, imagine you've got a really strong currency, like the dollar or the pound, you go to a country where the, the currency is worth next to nothing. Kilogram is a really strong currency, and it's worth millions and billions and squillions of the jewel. All right, I'm not sure, sure what the country with the jewel is like, but can you imagine that currency has been massively devalued? Yeah? So one kilogram, you turn up to their bureau de change. Okay, 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 I'm going to do that. One kilogram, okay. You're going to have to have nine times 10 to 16. Imagine more as little coins. Yeah? You're going to have to have nine times 10 to the 16. Nine with 16 zeros. Jewels. Yeah? So very strong currency is the mass kilogram. Very weak currency is the joule, all right? Because as we know, the joule is a titchy amount of energy, isn't it? Yeah, it's about the energy of a firmly potted golf ball, all right? So it's a very weak currency, the joule, and that's why this huge exchange rate. When you look at e equals mc squared, it's basically telling you there's a massive exchange rate, and that's why it's such an unlikely thing to do. Because if you were thinking at the top of the lesson, hang on a minute, you can make mass out of energy, so you just get like lots of energy together and suddenly a table appears, something like that. Can you see why that's quite difficult? If I want to make this out of pure energy, if I want to go into a chemistry lesson and say, no, number of moles before equals number of moles afterwards, it's not true. Look, I can make atoms out of just energy. Can you see? It's going to be very difficult, isn't it? I can make this out of pure energy. I can get a lot of energy together and just make this out of energy. But it would cost me 9 times 10 to the 16 joules. Okay, and that's a ferocious amount of energy. That's why you don't see this very often. How often do we make kilograms out of pure energy in the world, inside nuclear reactors and particle accelerators and stuff? Not really, all right? If, again, this sounded a bit unlikely that we turn mass and energy into each other, we tend to do it only in the world of the nucleus, all right? As we speak, inside nuclear power stations, mass and energy are being converted, all right? Inside the CERN... Uh, particle accelerator, it's being converted, but we're not talking kilograms, are you with me? Because a whole kilogram would cost this much, okay? But think of it like the currency thing, and it'll keep you with the right idea, okay? Let's just try and get our head around 9 times 10 to the 16, because it is an awfully big number. It's the amount of energy you would need to make this kilogram out of energy. Right, let's see if we can get our heads around this 9 times 10 to the 16 conversion, all right? So... Again, let's draw a little picture. If you had a one kilogram mass, like I was just waving around, and you wanted to make that either from energy or you wanted to turn it into energy, then it would obviously be an enormous amount of it. It would be nine times 10 to the 16 joules, okay? Now, let's imagine we actually wanted to do that. Let's get then um, a power station. Let's get a big power station, maybe. Now, I don't know the exact power output of the local power station, but it's probably in the, in the order of gigawatts, okay? It may be more, it may be less. But generally, power stations dish out energy at the rate of gigawatts, okay? A watt, as we know, means a joule per second, all right? So a one watt power station is producing one joule every second, okay? A typical modern power station may be somewhere in the gigawatts, okay? Which, as we know, is 10 to the 9... Yeah, kilo, thousand, ten to the three, mega, million, ten to the six, giga, ten to the nine, billion. Okay, let's see if we can work that out then. We want to get nine times ten to the sixteen, and if we say to our local power station, hang on, just stop all what you're doing, can you just produce an enormous amount of energy for us so we can make a kilogram out of nothing? Okay, then we would need them to produce nine times ten to the sixteen joules. How quickly can they make them at the rate of ten to the nine? Yeah, they can produce energy at the rate of 1 times 10 to the 9 joules per second. Okay, so if you divide those two numbers, you don't need a calculator. If you divide those two numbers, then that will tell you the number of seconds that we need to make that much energy. 9 divided by 1 is 9. Very good. 10 to the 16 divided by 10 to the 9 10 to the 7. So that would be 9 times 10 to the 7 seconds, all right? So if we got our local power station, which is a fairly large one, producing energy at 1 gigawatt to produce enough energy for 1 kilogram is going to take you 
9 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Okay? Um, 9 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Can we divide that by 60, 60, 24? How many years is that? I want to know. So divide it by 60, divide it by 60, divide it by 24. So if you divide by 60, divide by, divide by 60 to get it into minutes, um, divide it by 60 to get it into hours, 24 to get it into days, and 365 and a quarter to get it into years. Yeah, it doesn't matter, don't worry. Uh, about 2.8 years. 9 times 10 to 7 seconds is a lot of seconds, and if you divide by all those things, it turns out about 2.93 years. Okay? So... At the top of the lesson, I said I can turn mass into energy, but it's awfully difficult. A single kilogram, so to produce that out of pure energy, would need a large power station working for three years. So all the output from that power station going into nothing else for three years, roughly, to produce that. Do we get the idea, though? Yeah? This is a conversion rate. If you want to turn kilograms into joules, that's the number that you would need. Okay? Um, let's do it the other way around, then, shall we? Let's suppose I wanted to produce a joule of energy. So I want to produce roughly the energy of a firmly putted golf ball. I want to produce one joule of energy. Okay. How many kilograms am I going to need? Now this time the massive number is working against us, or whichever way you want to think about it. It's going to be 1 divided by 9 times 10 to the 16. What's that when it's at home? 1.1 Are we happy? Is it just one? No. There are nine ones off. No, that's fine, I'll leave them. Sorry. Are we happy? Yeah? So if you did that way round, then you would have one joule divided by nine times ten to the sixteen. It's going to be one point one times ten to the minus seventeen kilograms. Okay? Which kind of answers your question. You with me? If there was a reaction that took place and you were missing at the end of it you had ten to the minus twenty one of a kilogram less than you started with. Yeah, that's, and that's kind of what's happening in nuclear fission. Okay, so if we could arrange for this amount of mass to disappear, you would produce a whole joule of energy. Okay, and this isn't very big, is it? 10 to the minus 17 of a kilogram, that's very small. That's getting down towards the mass of atoms and things like that. And that gives us a clue as to where this reaction actually, this kind of thing actually happens. Okay, this sort of thing is just silly. All right, to give you a feeling for the numbers, this doesn't actually happen. What does happen is there are reactions that happen with atoms and with nuclei where you end up at the end with slightly less mass than you started with, and the way that's happened is that you've got more energy than you started with. Okay? Let's have a look at a couple of examples then of reactions where this does actually happen. Uh, the first reaction is called annihilation, all right, which is a nuclear reaction you're supposed to know about. Uh, annihilation can happen, for example, when you get particles like an electron and a positron. Okay? If you get those two sorts of particles meeting each other, then, as you probably know because you've watched Star Wars and Star Trek, that's an example of matter interacting with antimatter. All right? You may know that the positron is like the evil twin of the electron. All right? Every particle has its antiparticle equivalent. And it kind of mirrors the particle, so it's exactly the same mass, all sorts of other properties, exactly the same, but the charge and a few other things are the opposite. Okay? So the electron you're very familiar with, racing around the outside of atoms. Positron is the positive um, twin, if you like, of that particle. It is its antimatter, antiparticle twin. Okay? Now, if these two particles come together, then what happens, as you know, is it powers all our spaceships, apparently in Star Trek, I think is the matter and the antimatter annihilate each other and just bazoink. The matter disappears, all right? So instead of, you know, uh, GCSE being made to do calculations about things falling from a certain height, turning their GP into kinetic energy, here, this is a reaction that does actually happen. You're turning, mat you're turning matter into energy, okay? When this reaction happens, the particles disappear. They no longer exist. All right? Their matter has gone. All right? So next time you sat in a chemistry lesson and they talk about number of moles before, number of moles afterwards, all that sort of stuff, that's kind of true in the everyday world of real life. But in the world of the nucleus and nuclear particles and atomic particles, it's not entirely true. All right? It is possible to convert between mass and energy. And one situation where that happens is something called annihilation.
Okay. Now, let's see if we can work out how much uh, energy we're going to get. We've got two lots of, I know because I looked it up earlier, uh, the mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, and we've got two of them. Okay, and that energy is going to be converted into, sorry, that mass is going to be converted into energy. Okay, now, um, what's the conversion factor? Well, again, the more you think of it like currency exchange, the easier this will be. Okay, uh, the number we need to include in here. Uh, the number we need to include in here is 9 times 10 to the 16, okay? 9 times 10 to the 16 is the number of joules that you get per kilogram, okay? We haven't got one kilogram. That was a silly example we were doing earlier on. We haven't got one kilogram. We're not going to get 9 times 10 to the 16 joules. We're going to get that lot times by that lot, all right? So the answer to this problem is you take your 2 times the mass of the electron and times it by 9 times 10 to 16. Okay, what does that give us? 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Minus 13. Okay, um, which isn't a massive amount of energy. If that hit you in the face, you wouldn't really know about it. But when you're in a single electron, are you with me? That actually, when I say to you, comment on size of answer, that's a small amount of energy for a golf ball. But for an electron, that's a serious amount of energy, okay? Um, as you might imagine, because it's made from actually destroying that matter. That matter no longer exists. And this is actually quite a large amount of energy, okay? Um, just for symmetry, most nuclear reactions, or many nuclear reactions, work the same forwards and backwards. So if you took all of this information, I've just given you about annihilation, which does happen, um, what would be the equivalent reaction the other way around? If I can do this, what's that? What would be happening in this reaction? You wouldn't be taking two particles and disappearing. <coughs> them. Exactly. There is another reaction called... It's in your syllabus, pair production, okay, which is the exact opposite. You take a chunk of energy and you turn it into an electron and a positron pair, okay, and you can turn um, energy into other pairs of particles, okay. Um, how much energy would you need? Obviously, the same amount of energy. So, if you had a nuclear re reaction where you had this much energy lying around spare then it would be possible to turn that into a pair of particles. And this process is called pair production. Okay. Um, in bubble chambers, you with me, those things that show you what's going on inside nuclear reactions, you sometimes see, um, you sometimes see sort of dotty tracks, don't you, all sorts of squirrely lines. Okay. Have you ever seen those bubble chamber pictures where they show you particle tracks and stuff? You sometimes see tracks like this. Yeah, um, if you go into Google Image, put bubble chamber photograph, it will bring, bring up some random ones. If you have a look at them, you quite often see in the corner or somewhere, you'll see this happening. And obviously what's happened here is nothing, because the tracks only show up when there are charged particles moving, nothing has suddenly turned into a particle that goes that way and a particle that goes that way. Well, that's likely because one is plus and the other is minus. Okay, so pair production is quite common and you see it in bubble chamber pictures looking like that. Good bit of physics here, though. Um, why couldn't you turn it into two electrons? Um, a good way of thinking about it, if I said to you I'm going to take a huge amount of energy and turn it into two electrons. Now, in terms of mass energy, that's fine. As long as I've got this much energy, I've got enough energy to make two electron-sized particles. Okay. The problem is, we said conservation of mass that you've believed in for your whole life. Not really true. Conservation of energy that you've believed in for most of your life. Not really true. But there are, are some bits of physics we can hang on to. One of them is conservation of charge. All the mad stuff I've shown you this morning, it does conserve charge. And if you turn um, energy into an electron, it appears as an electron and a positron pair because the total charge before was zero and the total charge afterwards 
is zero. This reaction can't happen. If I show it to anybody else in the school, they go, well, that's just mad. You're turning energy into mass. Well, you know, that's not the problem. The problem is you've got zero charge to start with and you would have minus two units of charge afterwards. And that's why, although we can turn mass into energy quite cheerfully, like it's an everyday thing, you can't do this one because you would not be conserving charge, all right? So although we're throwing away some of the most important ideas in the physics that you've ever learned, there are some things to hang on to, and this happens. It's not called pair production for nothing, and it's always a plus minus. We'll see later on, you can produce other particles and electrons. They always appear as positive-negative pairs. Do you follow? Because otherwise, energy doesn't have any charge. You've not conserved charge, okay?